here's the here's chairman. Here's the chairman, yeah. Presidential election and related matters. I will now recognize myself for an opening statement. Attorney General Barr has informed us that he will not appear today. Although we worked to accommodate his concerns, he objects to the prospect of answering questions by staff counsel and to the possibility that we may go into executive session to discuss certain sensitive topics. Given the Attorney General's lack of candor before other congressional committees, I believe my colleagues and I were right to insist on the extended questioning. To my knowledge, not even the ranking member was opposed to the idea of moving into closed session if necessary. But even if Democrats and Republicans disagree on the format of this hearing, we must come together to protect the integrity of this chamber. The administration may not dictate the terms of a hearing in this hearing room. The challenge we face is bigger than a single witness. Late last night, the Department of Justice wrote to inform us that they will ignore our subpoena for the unredacted Mueller report and the underlying evidence. They have made no meaningful attempt at accommodating that subpoena, which was due yesterday. The letter references the Attorney General's offer to 12 members of Congress, 12 out of 435, to look behind some, but not all, of the redactions, provided that we agree not to discuss what we see with our colleagues and that we leave our notes behind at the Department of Justice. It is urgent that we see the documents we have subpoenaed, but I cannot agree to conditions that prevent me from discussing the full report with my colleagues and that prevent the House from acting on the full report in any meaningful way. An accommodation designed to prevent us from taking official action is no accommodation at all. Every member of this committee, Democrat and Republican alike, should understand the consequences when the executive branch tells us that they will simply ignore a lawful subpoena from Congress. If left unchecked, this act of obstruction will make it that much harder for us to hold the executive branch accountable for waste, fraud, and abuse, or to enact legislation to curb that kind of misconduct, or any kind of misconduct, no matter which party holds this chamber or the White House at a given moment. The challenge we face is also bigger than the Mueller report. If all we knew about President Trump were contained in the four corners of that report, there would be good reason to question his fitness for office. But the report is not where the story ends. In the days since the Department of Justice released the redacted version of the report, President Trump has told Congress that he plans to fight all of our subpoenas. The average person is not free to ignore a congressional sub subpoena, nor is the president. His promise to obstruct our work extends far beyond his contacts with the Russian government and allegations of obstruction of justice. The president has also prevented us from obtaining information about voting rights, ACA litigation, and his cruel family separation policy, among other matters. <coughs> the challenge we face is also not limited to this committee. In recent weeks, administration witnesses have simply failed to show for properly noticed depositions. The Secretary of the Treasury continues to ignore his clear statutory obligation to produce the President's tax returns. The President's private attorneys sued Chairman Cummings in his personal capacity in an attempt to block the release of certain financial documents. Ladies and gentlemen, the challenge we face is that the President of the United States wants desperately to prevent Congress, a co-equal branch of government, from providing any check whatsoever to even his most reckless decisions. He is trying to render Congress inert as a separate and co-equal branch of government. The challenge we face is that if we don't stand up to him together today, we risk forever losing the power to stand up to any president in the future. The very system of government of the United States, the system of limited power, the system of not having a president as a dictator is very much at stake. The Attorney General of the United States is sworn to uphold the Constitution as our nation's chief law enforcement officer. He has an obligation to do everything in his power to warn the President of the damage he risks and the liability he assumes by directly threatening our system of checks and balances and of limited government. Sadly, the Attorney General has failed in that responsibility. He has failed to check the President's worst instincts. He has not only misrepresented the findings of the Special Counsel, 
He has failed to protect the special counsel's investigation from unfair political attacks. He has himself unfairly attacked the special counsel's investigation. He has failed the men and women of the Department of Justice by placing the needs of the president over the fair administration of justice. He has even failed to show up today. Yes, we will continue to negotiate for access to the full report for another couple of days. And yes, we will have no choice but to move quickly to hold the attorney general in contempt if he stalls or fails to negotiate in good faith. But the attorney general must make a choice. Every one of us must make the same choice. That choice is now an obligation of our office. The choice is simple. We can stand up to this president in defense of the country and the Constitution and the liberty we love, or we can let the moment pass us by. I do not, and we have seen in other countries what happens when you allow such moments to pass by. I do not know what Attorney General Barr will choose. I do not know what my Republican colleagues will choose. But I am certain that there is no way forward for this country that does not include a reckoning with this clear and present danger to our constitutional order. History will judge us for how we face this challenge. We will all be held accountable in one way or the other. And if he does not provide this committee with the information it demands and the respect it deserves, Mr. Barr's moment of accountability will come soon enough. I now recognize the ranking member of the Judiciary Committee for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let's be very clear. There is only one reason, and one reason only, at this point, we are not being able to fulfill our constitutional role of oversight, and that is the chairman's demands that were played out yesterday. We could had a hearing today. What bothers me the most about this is not only did, in standing uh, for the questions that were discussed and the issues that have been discussed between me and the chairman, not only did he take the ability for the American people to hear again from Bill Barr, he took our ability to hear from Bill Barr today. To protect, maybe, because some didn't feel like they could ask proper questions, maybe they wanted more staff questions, who knows? But yesterday we found this, that he claims that he wants staff, questions, staff to question the Attorney General because the five minute per member is not enough. But yet we spent a, and approved a motion yesterday that said we could do a whole hour, an extra hour, between the chairman and myself. He could have took one of these fabulous members that he has, and he has some excellent attorneys on his side, some of the best. He could have given them all 30 minutes, and they could have questioned the attorney general any way they wanted to. Instead, we go back to a circus political stunt to say we want it to look like an impeachment hearing because they won't bring impeachment proceedings. That's the reason. Take whatever you want to take. You can go out and have press conferences. You can say it from this dice. You can say whatever you want to have. But the reason Bill Barr is not here today is because the Democrats decided they didn't want him here today. That's the reason he's not here. You could have done anything else you wanted. And what is amazing to me is to say that he is scared of answering questions, to scare that he's not. And you can disagree with the Attorney General all you want. But for yesterday, he sat for over almost six hours in the Senate voluntarily asking questions, even on a second round that was taken up by Democrats who wanted to ask more questions. And you can agree, did he do good, did he do bad? It doesn't matter, but we're not getting that opportunity today because the stunt in the circus continues over here. All we had to do, we agreed to more time. We could talk about executive session, but no. For some reason, for some purpose, except the optics of something they can't do or don't want to do right now, they wanted to have a staff member ask questions. I said before, if that staff member wants to ask questions in Desperately, run for Congress. Put a pen on. Find a committee. But you know, I can continue on and on and on about the issues that we have here and the impeachment agenda and whatever you want to have and saying that he's blackmailing this committee, he's terrified to come before this committee. I think yesterday he proved he's not terrified to sit before anybody, especially the Senate, which they actually extended the question time on. He answered the question, whether you like the question or not, as my chairman told me yesterday, it's not a matter of where we agree or disagree on this. We have the motions, we move the motion, we do the motion. You can agree with the attorney general or disagree with the attorney general, but not hearing from them is a travesty for this committee today. But I would be remiss if I also did not mention the largest tragedy of this day. 
that actually was from yesterday. The chairman just stated a few moments ago that we can't let moments pass, and I agree completely, because what happened yesterday on this dais was a travesty. When you do not recognize members for valid motions, when you call things dilatory, questioning the motives of what members are doing it for, I have sat on this committee for six years, and I have sat through hours of motions to strike the last word, of giving other members on the minority side more time, more time. One of my biggest concerns I ever had with Chairman Goodlatte is why do you let it continue? Just call the previous question. And on two, two occasions last Congress, he did. On re our resolutions of inquiry, after almost six to seven hours of debate, the question I have here is not what Bill Barr is scared of. My question is, what are the Democrats scared of? They don't want Bill Barr here today. They've had the report. They've read it. They don't like what's in it. The chairman won't even go look at what the attorney general offered him. It's pretty amazing to me. He wants to go in executive session and ask questions about it, but he won't go read it. Now, you can go read it and ask for more. But here's the problem today, and this problem from yesterday is not over. If the majority wants to run a committee in which minority rights do not matter, parliamentary procedure does not matter, we saw it on full display yesterday, it will not continue. We will continue this in exercise, and we will exercise what we have as minority, which is the minority rights to ask questions, to make motions. Because at the end of the day, unless we've forgotten, Mr. Chairman, you've got more votes than we do. You will get what you want. But just like we sat on this side and you sat on this side and got to spend hours talking about whatever you wanted to talk about while Chairman Goodlatte sat there and let you do it. And all you wanted to, and the question that bothered me the most yesterday is we've got time, we've got to get onto another bill. Timing does not trump minority rights. And there's not a member on this dais that should say it's not. And freshman members or anybody else who's here for the first time, that's not how this committee works. And if you don't believe me, ask Chairman Sensenbrenner for three times. Three times was chairman of this committee. And he laid it out clearly yesterday. But when we degregate members of my side calling Ms. Lesko's amendment, ridiculous, calling ours dilatory. That's just wrong and should offend everybody on this dais. Mr. Chairman, this is wrong. The tragedy of today is not that you have an empty chair, not that you have props. You can call the attorney general whatever you want. You know, I'm reminded of sticks and stones kind of quote. But what really bothers me today is, is the travesty of what happened in minority rights yesterday. And there's not a member of the Democrats who were on this committee last year that can honestly look me in the face and say, y'all were not treated much better by a chairman who actually followed the rules than we were treated yesterday. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Collins. Ordinarily, at this point, I would introduce the witness. But instead, but instead, we will conclude this proceedings. I just want to say, we didn't choose not to have Mr. Barr come. He chose. We, will, we cannot permit him anybody in the administration to dictate the manner in which we function. This does not include our inquiry into the Attorney General's handling of the Mueller report. Point of parliamentary or inquiry. His conduct before Congress. Nor does it conclude our efforts I seek recognition to compel for production inquiry. of the entire report and its underlying materials. We will not hear from the Attorney General today, but this committee intends to obtain the information that it needs to conduct its constitutional oversight and legislative responsibilities. We will defend the prerogatives of Congress. We will defend the rights of the American people to know what's going on. We will defend the constitutional uh, scheme of equal and coordinate branches of government. We will make sure that no president becomes a monarch. We need the information without delay. The hearing Mr. Is Chairman, I, and we'll do so with trampling minority rights. It, it, going to be, Mr. Chairman, where there, are, there is not going to be a recognition of members who seek legitimate inquiry as to the procedures. Hello? What's happening, guys? Okay. Well, 
You heard Jerry Nadler, the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee there, uttering the words, normally at this point I would introduce the witness. Right. Of course, there is no witness. Uh, Bill Barr d did not show up, but, but, it, but some theatrics there with Republicans on the committee blaming Democrats for Bar Barr's no-show, saying that they imposed uh, rules, et cetera, uh, that then denied Republican members a chance to right. question Barr. Uh, interesting argument there, but, the, but there were clearly some, some fireworks at the, at the House committee hearing yesterday when they were discussing right. the rules of this, right. of this procedure. And you had the ranking Republican there, uh, Doug Collins, who you just heard from calling this a, essentially a political circus in his words, and the chair of the committee, Jerry Nadler, who now has the power to decide if they will hold uh, Barr in contempt or if they will subpoena him, saying that this is a moment of accountability. Uh, that it will come soon enough for Bill Barr and that history will judge them with how they handle this. Let's bring our experts back in. I believe we have Democrats and Republicans, guys, who will go to the mics uh, and, and make their case, and we'll bring you those as they come. But, but Laura Coates, just to you, you were mid-thought mm. when we jumped into this. What is your takeaway? Well, now you have this idea of form over substance, Poppy, because the idea here is that why did Barr choose not to come? Well, we know that Dr. Christine Blasey Ford had to actually submit to questioning from somebody other than a member of Congress, and yet that was deemed acceptable. So why the change now? But you have the arguments being made on both sides, essentially. First of all, as the head lawyer in the country, you should be more than capable of fielding questions about issues, even if it comes from another lawyer as opposed to a member of Congress. On the other side, you have the idea, well, look, couldn't there have been some flexibility ability to allow the American people and members of Congress to proceed with questioning. But I think that's the way he said it best yesterday when he was actually interviewing um, William Barr, when he said, look, Barr seems to know the rules of filibusters perhaps even better than members of Congress. So perhaps he was hoping to run out the clock as opposed to having the opportunity to have holistic questioning that could be followed through, follow-up questioning. Even without all that being said, and with it all being said, however, it really is absurd that this is a form over substance matter when William Barr should be more than capable of answering questions about matters of extreme importance, yeah. of which Congress has the ability and the right to exercise oversight. David Challey, and you heard Doug Collins, the ranking Republican's argument there, uh, saying that you know the Democrats were imposing rules uh, that, that were unfair, in effect blaming the Democrats for the fact that Barr didn't show up, which is, which is a bit of a stretch, you might say. But, but do, you, do you understand what the complaints are? Are they legitimate complaints? Well, he's complaining about uh, minority rights, right, in a majority rules uh, scenario. And, uh, you know, this is uh, the difference of elections. He's claiming that the Republican majority on this committee treated uh, the Democratic minority in the last Congress uh, far better uh, than Chairman Nadler is treating the Republicans in the minority. Now, listen, I, I, I look at this and I said, God, I can't imagine why America doesn't really love Congress, how hold it in high regard, mm -hmm. or think that their government is is functioning well. I mean, this this is a bit absurd. I understand uh, both sides are, are going to make their points, but uh, if this is what um, government looks like, Congress and congressional oversight looks like, uh, I think it's it, it it loses whatever substantive point on uh, the balance of powers between the branches, whatever Nadler's trying to make here. I, I think this sort of showmanship uh, doesn't help either side really make their point.